Great to be here. Happy New Year, everyone. A great new start. Every year is a great year, new opportunities. And uh, every year, it's great to start it with a fresh engagement with God. I encourage you and invite you to join with us as we go through the season of prayer and fasting. But if you're going to do that, then I encourage you to do these things. Number one, set a goal. Be purposeful. If you're not purposeful and have no goal, then you'll soon fade out about morning tea time. Uh, so have a goal, something you're believing God for. And uh, secondly, uh, establish the period of time. Three, establish uh, uh, also what it is you're gonna fast from. And uh, so you're very clear what that'll be. So set that up before you start, otherwise you won't complete. And then exchange, add additional time into seeking the presence of God personally. It's in that season where it's not just one day we do something, it's over a period of time. That's when you find your whole disposition and your attitude and many things shift. And so uh, a really good fast shifts us physically, emotionally, spiritually, and it awakens our hunger for God. Amen? Remember, how many believe for a great year this year? I mean, it'll be a year of challenges. I can tell you now, I assure you now prophetically, there'll be many challenges this year. And so we want to prepare for that. And uh, I'm going to do a series uh, in the church called Strong Spirit, a Strong Spirit series. And uh, we're going to do the first one today, and uh, I'll be on uh, after we have a break next week, and Pastor David will be back. I'll do two or three in the series, maybe more, who knows. And uh, I've got a whole lot of things that I'd love to share with you and help you in. But I want to share with you today about building uh, the need for a strong spirit, the need for a strong spirit. Spirit. The Bible tells us that those who are strong and know their God shall do exploits. So Daniel foresaw the end times when there'd be tremendous turmoil and it would be a time when you needed to personally know God. Not enough just to come to church, that's a wonderful thing to do, but building your own relationship with God and developing strength inside you. It's really time the church develops strength, inward strength in the spirit. So I want to share with you, I've got a lot of things to share about developing a strong spirit. So today, I want just to open up and talk about the need for a strong spirit and introduce a few things on the way. So let's first of all, in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, uh, I want to look, just look again at the threefold nature of man. And here it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you or make you whole. Make you whole. Sanctify you completely. Make your whole spirit, soul, and body to be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So notice he's talking about a preparation work that he desires happen in our life that will go on until the Lord returns. And in the middle of this verse, he identifies how God has designed us. Notice there, spirit, soul, body. Spirit, soul, and body. So the Bible distinguishes your body, your soul, and a part of you called your spirit. If you live in the secular world, they won't talk really about your spirit. There's no teaching around that. The essential teaching around our spirit is found in the Bible. And so God has designed us. He's designed us to act as his representative in the earth. That's his plan. And in order, to, so he's designed us then to live in a physical world and also live in a spirit world. The spiritual world and the physical world overlap one another like that. Sometimes when we think about God, we're thinking about someone somewhere a long way up where you need to think of dimensions overlapping one another like that. And we can live in the physical world. You have a physical body to enable you to do that. Physical senses, you receive from your physical senses. They go into where you process them in your soul and you make decisions about what you're gonna do. So you smell something cooking, smell some sausages and onions, suddenly you, you know exactly what that is, the barbecue's hot, now suddenly you feel hungry, now I'm gonna start to move to get that food or whatever it is, a lovely great steak. So our physical senses are what we interact with the physical world with. And so if we lack any of those senses, our life quality in the physical world is very, very shallow. It's limited in many ways. For imagine if you lost your vision, how your life would be affected. If you, if you lost your ability to speak, how would your life be affected? If you lost your ability to feel things or taste things, 
Your life would be deeply impacted. So we need physical senses to engage with the physical world, interact with it, and interpret what we're having, what's happening. But you are also designed, we're all designed to have a spirit man. There's a part of us which is called our spirit. We're designed in the image of God and God is a spirit. So you have a part of you called your spirit. And your spirit is designed with senses so you can sense the spiritual realm around you. Every person has that capacity. You have the capacity to see in the spirit realm. It may not be developed, but you still have it. You have the capacity to hear the voices from the spirit realm, whether it be the voice of demons or the voice of God. We need to learn to discern what we're listening to. We have the ability to taste or experience God. We can experience things from the spirit realm, both good and evil. We have the ability to feel and engage the spirit realm. Every person has that ability, and that ability is through your spirit. So we have our physical body engages the physical world. Our spirit man engages the realm of the spirit simultaneously. And your soul and heart are where you process what you're receiving. So we receive impressions from our, our physical senses. We decide what we're picking up and make decisions about it. And sometimes there's something new happens. I remember going to, uh, to Singapore and they had some durian. And I came there and all I could smell was this horrible smell. <laughs> Ugh, what is that? They said it's durian. Now I got no framework for durian. I never heard of the name, never seen the thing, never smelt it, tasted it, no experience whatsoever. So my senses are picking up something which I didn't like the smell of, but I've got no reference point to know what it is and how to interact with it. And then they showed me the fruit. And said, ah, that's what it is, durian. Now I know. I have an experience. I've been able to interpret it. Now I'm able, every time I go back there, oh, that's durian. And I noticed they say, no durian in the lift, no durian in the hotel, no durian on the bus, no durian in the taxi. That's a reason for that. It stinks. And some people love it. They get addicted to it. Anyway, that's them. I'm, I'm not, I never even wanted to taste it. So that's the physical realm. You have experiences and you begin to create memories which you can interact with. Okay, so for example, a mother hears the voice of her child and she learns the voice of her child and there can be a room full of crying babies and the mother will say, that's my baby's crying. And you say, how do you know? There's a lot of noise. How do you know it's yours? Oh, I know. In other words, she through experience has tuned to the sound of that baby has built up memory experiences of that interaction, and when she hears it, now she knows how to interpret that. That's the same with your spirit man. Your spirit man also has senses, but if we don't uh, interpret and understand what's happening, if we don't tune into our spirit, if we don't know how to listen and engage by our spirit with the spirit realm, we will be oblivious to the things affecting us. So many people become depressed and they don't realize something from the spirit realm has attacked them. Many people become condemned. They feel they're not good enough. And part of that is a lie inside them, but it's empowered from the spirit realm. So many of the problems that we face on the earth, the Bible describes from the worldview of the Bible, an invisible kingdom that exerts influence over all the earth and is the source and cause of all the evil and wars and poverty and conflict. I hear, and you'll no doubt read about too much population. It's actually totally a lie. Or oh, not enough food. No, that's totally a lie too. There's greedy people and people who are manipulating it all, but the earth is designed for man to fill it and occupy it and to be fruitful. And so, but if you don't know and have a biblical worldview and a biblical view of how God designed you, you just flow with the crowd and be oblivious to the life that's possible in God. Any idea? So those two realms exist together. You don't have to sort of do anything great to engage with God because you're already connected to him. What is required is you become aware of his presence and you want his presence to manifest tangibly. The Bible says, for example, that God is everywhere. You can't flee away from him. His presence is everywhere. But people don't feel or experience his presence until they learn how to open up and engage with him. So what you and I need 
is the tangible presence of God, something you can feel, it's tangible, you experience it. The love of God is something you need to experience. It's real. I remember one woman came in. She was sitting down just over there, and she was crying the whole service. I went up to her after the service. I said, what's happening? And I just introduced myself. It's her first time here, and she said, I don't know what's happening to me. She said, I walked through that door. When I walked through that door, I began to cry, and I've not stopped crying the whole service. What is happening to me? I don't know what's happening. I don't understand. So with her mind with no experience and understanding, she is trying to interpret what's happening spiritually. That make sense to you? The natural mind can't interpret things of the spirit. So we need spiritual revelation. I said, oh, it's really simple what's happened. You've walked in here deeply wounded and broken in your heart and life, and you felt the presence of God's spirit. You couldn't see him, but it was so tangible and he saw your need that he manifested his love for you. I said, you've just been feeling loved and it's caused all the grief and the tears to come up out of your heart. She said, that's exactly what's happening to me. Now that we need the tangible presence of God. That's where the miracles happen. You getting the idea? Okay, so sin caused a deep separation. Sin will always separate us from the presence of God. But God has got a way of dealing with that, and we want to see how to do that. Now, when Adam and Eve sinned, they lost their union and connection with God and ability to receive from Him. Now, you have to understand this. When Adam and Eve lost their ability to receive from God, then what happened to them was they were forced, no, they could no longer live out of their spirit. They had to live out of their body and their soul. So when people are unsafe, when people don't know Christ, they live governed by their appetites for the food, drink, sleep, uh, drugs, uh, sexual activity. This compels them and draws them to make decisions, often bad ones. A person who's not saved, if they can't access the presence of God, will live out of their body or live out of their soul. Living out of their soul means primarily they're driven by their emotions. All of you know people that they make emotional decisions all the time. They're driven by their emotions. They're not living a spirit life. They're living out of their soul, a soulish or carnal life. Some people, uh, because they have no access to God or are cut off from God for various reasons, they then will depend on their intellect. And so their intellect becomes their God and the driver of their life, their ability to reason and to work it out. For other people, their God becomes their will. It's just by sheer willpower, they can make stuff happen in their life. So when we're disconnected from God, when we are without empowerment in our spirit, we then live out of circumstances, out of our body and what it wants, out of our feelings, out of our ideas and thoughts, and out of the opinions and pressures from around us. We're living a life governed by what's outside us, not a life governed by God and His Word within us. And so... When we talk about building a strong spirit, it's so you can develop the capacity to draw from the life of God every day wherever you are. And unless you understand how to do that, then it'll all seem like a mystery to you. So we want to remove the mystery away from it all. So let's have a look what God did when uh, he saw the problem of sin in man. Let's read in, in uh, Scripture here in Ezekiel 36, verse 26 and 27. So how does God repair the problem caused by sin where we have a tendency to live out of our body, our thoughts, our emotions, our will, or the opinions of everyone else? Living carnally. How does he fix that up? Well, he has to deal with the issue in our spirit. The Bible says without God, our spirit is dead. It doesn't mean your spirit isn't present. It's just dead spiritually. It's separated from God. So here, read it in Ezekiel 36. And this is the promise of the new covenant. Now, look at this. Ezekiel 36, 26. I'll give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. New spirit. I'll put a new spirit in you. And I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So notice he describes the person who's without God, a person born into this world, he's unsaved. Their heart is a stony heart, hard, unfeeling. 
Their spirit is dead to God. And he says, this is the promise he makes. This is the promise of the new covenant that I will change your heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I'll put my spirit in you. Let's read on. I will put, verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. So notice the tremendous change that God says or promise to us. He says, I will help you with the issue with your heart. I will help you with the issue with your spirit. I will soften your heart. What does that mean? A new heart. It means whereas we were indifferent to God, now our heart is awakened to want him. Now we can have lots of brokenness and various issues and wrong beliefs in our heart, but at the core, there is now, once you've given your life to Christ, there's now a desire for God. There's something missing Without God, we need God. No matter what you do, there's something still missing because your heart is now turned towards God. Now, you can resist that and harden your heart and walk away from God, or you can choose to allow yourself to develop your heart. And we need the courses in healing of the heart and establishing the heart. We'll deal with those later on in the year. I want to talk about the spirit. So God says, I will put my spirit in you. So if you're in this world and you're not saved, then you have the human spirit, which is disconnected from God, can't help you much. It's still got some action and activities. You won't go into those today. The first one is anyway, it keeps you alive. So while your spirit's in you, you're alive. When your spirit goes, you're dead. Simple as that. So your spirit is really important. Got lots of other reasons for it too, but it keeps you alive. And, but however, here's the thing. What God does, he said, he makes a whole new different kind of person. He puts his spirit into them. And now you have what's called, you'd call it a hybrid. It is part God, part man, because the spirit of God has become joined to you. Now you may look like you're the same. You may feel like you're the same. You may feel you're different, no different to anyone else, but actually you are. If you've received Christ, then the spirit of God has entered and joined with your spirit. You now have a power source. You now have a provision source. You now have access to things of God to empower you in your destiny, empower you in your assignment, to also lead you and guide you and to help you overcome whatever is there and to, allow, and to help you change in your life. That's what God puts his spirit in there for. We have to look at that at another time, all the the reasons God puts his spirit in there. But once you've received the spirit of God, you're no longer what you were. You're now a God-man hybrid. That's the best way I could describe it without using religious language. You're now completely different. That's why the Bible calls you a new creation. You're different. You've been joined to God. Now, what you do with that, well, that's another thing. So what God says he will do is he will put his spirit in you, but you've got to decide what you will do to develop your relationship with the Holy Spirit and to grow and develop your spirit. You can remain impoverished inside or you can develop spiritually, you can develop very strong. And there's some ways you can go about doing that. But today we want to look at the the, the benefits of it. Now, Here's something I want to touch on. I'm not going to go into it far, but I just want to throw some things out because I feel like I need to help many of you overcome this issue. The Bible talks about two covenants that God has made with man. There's the old covenant found in the Old Testament. There's the new covenant, and we just read it now. I will put my spirit in you. I will soften your heart, and I will cause you to want to do and to walk in all the things that please me. That's the new covenant. Now, the old covenant, the Old Testament was given in Exodus 19 and on, on the mount when Moses came down from the mount. The new testament was given, or new covenant was given in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, they're really different. Here's why I'm just raising this right now, because Most people who have given their life to Christ drop back into old covenant thinking and living and do not live out of the Spirit and do not have power in their life. And it's quite easy to see because they constantly never feel good enough. And their prayer life is weak. Now, let me just help you without going too far into this because I want to focus on the, 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 the benefits of developing your spirit. In the old covenant was based on something. 
it was based on two things. It was based, num number one, it was based on rules and laws. It was based on the law. Thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that, blah, 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 all the laws. And second thing it was based on is your ability to obey them. So it depended on you. God says they're the laws and the old covenant, you had to keep them to get blessed. You understand what that means? It means you had to work to get blessed. So the old covenant was about you working, earning, deserving. And it's very easy to slip back into that and to think that that's how we can relate with God, working, earning, deserving. Oh, I didn't work, I didn't earn, I don't deserve. You understand? That's what happens. And we'll go into that perhaps at another time. I just want to get you some highlights on this. So that's the old covenant. Under the law, we work hard to get the blessing of God. Got to do this, I 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 got to do this to get the blessing of God. It's all about me doing something. You understand? And being good enough. And how many, if you're honest, would say, actually, I never feel I'm doing enough and I never feel I'm good enough. This is a consequence of living under that covenantal thinking. You don't have a relationship with God that way. That's what's called a, a, a relationship of servant. Now, in the Old Testament, uh, Abraham had two wives. One was Hagar and one by his concubine. Uh, and one was with Hagar. And, uh, and remember that Hagar, is, uh, Sarah, 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 Abraham's wife, was barren. And so... She come up with a great idea. Why don't you sleep with Hagar, who's my concubine, and then have a child, and then at least we'll help God fulfill his promises. We'll do it for him. So they're all wanting a child, and God's promised them a child. Nothing's happening, getting really old. So Sarah comes up with a brilliant idea. Hey, why don't you do this? Let's, let's not worry about God. Well, just, you help yourself. And so the result of that was that they had Ishmael. Ishmael is the, the, the root and the, the source of all of the Arab nations. And although God said he would bless Ishmael, he said they would always be a wild man contending with everyone. How about that? Now, here's the thing about Hagar. Hagar was a servant. She was not in an intimate relationship with Abraham. She was a servant to Abraham. Her whole thing was serving. You got to do, 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 work, 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 work. She represents, the Bible tells us in Galatians 4, Paul says, that represents the old covenant. You're a servant, you obey, you do, you work hard. And here's the thing you need to know. God divorced her because she could never produce the fruit. God, does separate, God has brought in a new covenant which operates differently. So Abraham was married to Sarah. Sarah had to believe God for the blessing to come. So the new covenant is quite different to the old. The old one, I got to work hard, I got to do, and I got to earn the blessing, earn the blessings of God and be good enough. But the new covenant, the new covenant is based on what God will do. It's not based on what I do. It's based on what God will do, what he has done, what he's promised. It's quite a different relationship. And if I want to live in the spirit and develop a strong spirit, I cannot have old covenant thinking in my walk with God. I must understand the new covenant is completely different. Under the new covenant, we, we are blessed and we grow, not by working hard and deserving, but believing and receiving. It operates by faith. Now, the trouble for most Christians is they slip out of faith and just work harder and it never works out. It's always going to be barren. It'll never produce what God wanted to produce. Sure, he'll bless you as you walk and do the things that are right and obey the laws, but actually God is looking for an intimate relationship. It's a big difference between the, being the wife and being the servant. To be the wife is about an intimate relationship. It's about union. It's about trusting. It's about being joined. So Sarah in the Bible represents the relations God is seeking with us a relationship of love based on his covenant that he will do it. How about that? So the relationship we have with God is symbolized by the relationship of Abraham and Sarah and God's promise that he would provide, he would bless. So either you're working for it or you're believing for it. You can't be doing both. Under the old covenant, you work hard, to deserve or to be good enough for the blessings of God. Under the new covenant, Christ did it for you on the cross. My goal 
is to become joined to Christ, come into agreement with him, and believe what is mine. That's really quite different. Most Christians are struggling because they've slipped into old covenant thinking, and old covenant thinking will always lead, I haven't done enough, I'm not good enough. That's why nothing's happening. You have to, and maybe I'll do a message on breaking free of legalism. You've got to break free of that mentality. Paul says, if you do that, you cannot walk in the supernatural power of God. To move in the power of God, it's all about believing God and listening to the voice of God and doing what he says to do. So one is about obedience and laws and my works. The other is about God has done the work. I need to become united with him in my faith and believe what he has done and he'll do it for me. Okay, you're getting the thing. Well, I don't go any further than that. Just wanted to get you to see that you cannot live the life of the spirit if you constantly go back to the law. Now, if you've come from a religious background, the tendency to do that will be enormous. It's like your program. The natural mind doesn't want to yield, surrender, and trust. It wants to just be self-sufficient and do. And the problem with the law is the law just reveals over and over again, we haven't done enough and we're not good enough. So this is a whole area of bondage. We want to pray, get people free on it at some stage. Anyway, so now let's just flow then and talk about what happens when we receive Christ. When you receive Christ, when you believe that God has done all the work on the cross through Christ, that Christ has paid the price, we receive him as our savior by saying, Jesus, I am a sinner. I have violated all your law. I'm suffering in my life because of it. I believe Christ died for me and I turn and repent of my sin and receive Christ and what he has done. When we do that, we are now no longer under rules. We're now the Spirit of God comes in. Our heart gets changed. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, we become joined to the law like a marriage relationship. The Spirit of God comes to live inside you. Now you have to learn how to live from your spirit not from your head and your reasoning, not from your feelings, not from circumstances, not from what your body's telling you. You've got to learn a new way of living, living in the spirit. And to do that, you need to develop your spirit. That make sense? You need to develop, I see you're taking it all in. You've gone all quiet on me. <laughs> now, our spirit can be a different condition. We we can, uh, and, and what I want to talk about is developing a strong spirit. But in the Bible, it talks about people in uh, Exodus 6 9, it talks about people being in anguish of spirit or despondent or down because of their circumstances. It affected their spirit. It talks about having hardened spirit. In Deuteronomy 20 and verse 30, uh, 2 and verse 30, it talks about a hardened spirit and being stubborn. In, uh, in Proverbs 15, verse 13, look at this. A merry heart makes a cheerful face, but by sorrow of heart, the spirit is broken. So your spirit can be broken or deeply wounded. And when it's wounded, then you have health problems. Overwhelmed, you can be overwhelmed. In Psalm 77, 3, I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed, become weak and enveloped in problems. That's where a lot of people live, overwhelmed with the things, rather than a rising inside with strength and faith. Our spirit can be anxious. Daniel 2, 3, the king said to them, I've had a dream and my spirit is anxious or troubled. So some people have an anxious spirit there, anxious inside, stressed all the time. And then the Bible talks in Malachi 2, 16, having a treacherous spirit. All of those stop us being fruitful. We need to develop what's called a strong spirit. Now, let me show you some people who developed a strong spirit. And uh, you can strengthen your spirit, and it's not hard to do. You've just got to be the one who decides, I will not be weak in spirit. I am determined to grow strong in my spirit and in my sensitivity to God. Now, let me just show you something here in Luke uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 80. Now, this is about John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist had an assignment to go to the nation which was backslidden and to prepare the way for Jesus Christ. Now, imagine if you were told that you've got an assignment and your assignment is to go into the nation of New Zealand and nation Samoa and to prepare them all, the Messiah's about to come. That's a huge challenge and task. 
And it's, but it, in order to prepare him for it, God had to grow him inside. Now, notice what it says here in Luke chapter 1. It says, uh, the child grew. That means he grew up physically. And he became strong in spirit. He became strong. He wasn't born strong in spirit. No one is born strong in their spirit. You're born with a spirit. You have to become strong. You can also become weak. You choose to become strong. The word strong there means, it's the word krateo in Greek, and uh, it means to be energized, be full of vigor, full of life, overflowing with energy on the inside, eh? a strong spirit. Now, I've, I, now you will meet people, you can't even feel their spirit. It is so weak and hidden away, it's like you're not meeting them at all. One of the functions of our spirit is to commune and connect with God, and another is to connect with people. So if people's spirit is broken, damaged, weak, and, and they've cloaked it with uh, shame, they hide away, and you never really know them. You can't know them. We're to know people after the spirit. So if a person is hiding their spirit, hiding what they're like, I know something's broken, something's wrong, or they're hiding something. Can that make sense to you? So, so John the Baptist grew and he became strong in spirit. Not a matter of being strong in muscles, strong in spirit. That he became strong. And so he had to develop that. There was a process of development. See, to become strong means you've got to do something. So, like, so, so you know, you may want to get some muscles. Like tea. You've got to go to the gym. You go down there the first day, you don't know how to use all the equipment. You just, oh, People don't even use it right. They make a mess of it. You've seen some of the clips on, on, on people going to the gym and they, they know how to use the gear. It's just a mess. But then you learn how to use the gear. You take what resources are provided and then you work on a program and work and work and work and gradually strength physically develops. Strength develops. It isn't something you can magically get given to you by someone laying hands on you or praying. You come up the front and say, give me muscles. Will you pray for me for muscles? They, come on. Go do some workout, you know. And it's the same with Christian, with your spirit. You can't just come up and say, I pray I'll have a really strong, powerful spirit like Samson. No, 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 no. You've got to do stuff. Go to the gym, Holy Ghost gym, and work out. When you've worked out, then you will become strong. And there will be a lot of things happen in your life because you become strong in spirit. So, okay. So here's another one who becomes strong, and that's Jesus himself. In Luke 2, verse 40, now the child grew. That's Jesus grew physically. And he became strong in spirit. That's the same word again. Filled with vigor, filled with energy, filled with night. Not sort of passive and shut down and you hardly know the person's there. Not mousy, anything like that. That shows the spirit is weak and the soul dominates the person's life. They're in bondage. Not only to their soul, but probably to demonic spirits as well. Jesus became strong. Don't you love that? <laughs> that word means exuberant resilient, having an enormous reserve of energy to keep going. How about that? It's the complete opposite of being passive, lethargic, fragile, feeble. Now, your body may be feeble and weak, but your spirit can be full of life and vibrant. You understand your spirit is not your body. Your spirit affects your body. What's happening in your body and soul can affect your spirit. They're all interconnected. But you can develop a strong spirit. And we need to build strong people in the church for this year. Amen? So, so a, a person who is strong in spirit, when they get a setback, when something comes against them, they can bounce back and they're into it again. They're not quitters. They've got a bounce back effect. You know, you've seen some people in the ring and boof, and they got knocked down, and they stood up again and got back into it again. Now, that's what this is like to be, to have a strong spirit means get back up, get in, never quit. It, there's an inward capacity to bounce back no matter what happens. People say, he's finished, he's done. Whoa, he come back. That's about the 10th time he's come back. He got resilience. He got strength in his spirit. So that's what that word means. You don't bounce back. I hear, like some people have a bit of a setback and, oh, I'm going to stop praying. 
I love to go come to church. What else? That's just weakness. It's, it's a decision to give in to your soul and the flesh and not to trust God. He can give you strength to overcome. Amen? Amen. Who want to be in a place of faith this year? Believing God. Okay, so the, here's another guy who got strong. You like this guy? This is called David. And we find in 1 Samuel verse, chapter 30, verse 6, it says, David was greatly distressed because the, speak, the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of the people was grieved, every one of them. But David strengthened himself in the Lord. Now, David had suffered a massive setback. Here's the setback. His city was burnt to the ground. He'd lost his place of refuge, his house. His finances were all stolen. He'd lost all his money. His wife and children were all taken away. And apart from all of that, all the men that followed him were all talking now about stoning him and killing him. They were blaming him for the problem. That is as distressing as it can get. Everything he had was removed except one thing, his relationship with God. And so in the midst of it, it says this vital word, when everyone else is crying and complaining, David wept and then strengthened himself in the Lord. And when he strengthened himself in the Lord, God gave him a download of revelation, what to do, wisdom and understanding. That's what God gave Jesus because he developed a strong spirit. He grew also in wisdom, in understanding and favor with God and men. You need all of those things to succeed in life. When David strengthened himself in the Lord, God gave him wisdom and direction what to do. As a result of that, he restored the confidence of his men. They got by everything they lost and more. And he was then shortly after promoted to the king over Judah. So he strengthened himself in the Lord. The question you got to ask is, how do you do that? If he could do that and all that stuff changed, how can I do that? If David could strengthen himself, then how can I do that? If Jesus grew in strength, how do I grow in strength? If John the Baptist grew in strength, how can I grow in strength? I need to grow in strength. Tell someone next to you, you need to grow stronger this year. Grow stronger this year. So your spirit can become empowered. And the one who empowers your spirit, guess who it is? Who is it? Who is it and how does he do it? That's the que- You've got to ask questions. You keep asking the questions and then that causes the way open up for God to speak to you. So in Ephesians chapter three, verse 16, your spirit can become highly energized, not with human energy, but with the power of the Holy Ghost. Look at this. And Paul is praying for the Ephesian believers, everyone, that God would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Strengthen. Here it is, strengthen. Become strong. That's the word, cardio. To become strong, increase in vigor, become resilient, become powerful. He said, Paul is praying that you would become strengthened. It's his prayer, not just for the Ephesian church, it's for us as well in a sin. God wants us to become strengthened. How did he become strengthened? Strengthened with might. That word might is the word dunamis, supernatural strength. Not a natural strength, not willpower, not soul power, not muscle power, not culture power. This is something only God can put inside you. He said, strengthened with energy, vibrancy, life, bounce back ability, stand strong ability by the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Spirit is the source of it. It's not you working harder. It's not you trying harder. You just keep saying, I'm weak. And Paul said, when I'm weak, I'm strong because then the grace of God and power of God is with me. I've learned not to focus on being weak, but to lean in the strength that God wants to put into my life. You understand? That's where bounce back ability comes. That's where longevity gets on. That's how people stay in their walk because they maintain vibrancy in their spirit. I pray that God will grant you out of the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might in the inner man, in your spirit man. 
And then he lists a whole lot of benefits of it. Well, so many benefits. You want the benefits, we've got to do the work. Got to do the mahi, got to do the work, see? Not only that, but our spiritual senses, you can, one, become strong in your spirit. Two, you can learn to train your spirit senses so you hear and see and feel and engage and become a spirit person wherever you are. Imagine walking through life and you're blind all the time. Can't see what's really going on. Or you can't hear what's going on or you can't feel anything's going on. And that's where the majority of, of Christians today are. But God wants you to be strengthened in the Spirit and out of your relationship with the Holy Spirit, develop sensitivity to the Spirit of God and Spirit things. Hebrews 5.14, he talks about being immature. He said, you've been in the church a long time. You should be teaching everyone else, but you need someone who gives you the meek. And he then talks about having developed your senses by practice. So there's some things can only be done by practice. Hebrews 5, 14. So we've got senses, spiritual senses, but you've got to practice them. And we have to teach you how to do that. Okay, and here's the third thing on that. And that is that a strong spirit is evidence you have grown spiritually. Now, the Bible talks about babies, young men, fathers. Now, spiritual development has nothing to do with how long you've been in church. You can be in church for years and still be a baby. Baby needs to be told, God loves you. We love you. You are going to be okay. You got a problem. Huh? We'll come and help you and we'll pray for you and counsel you and minister to you. That's baby. Baby something that they want. Babies want milk. You can't give them a bone. You can't give them meat. You can't give them a good steak. Got no teeth. Can't eat it. So you have to give them simple stuff. Like God loves you and God forgives you and God wants to bless you. And all of that sort of stuff is milk. It's true but it's baby stuff. And you can't take, see, you, you can't force a baby to eat meat. You gotta grow them and then they get some teeth. And then they, mm, mm. Yeah, I haven't got many now, but however, I got some help with artificial ones. But, but you need teeth to bite steak. <laughs> see, otherwise it's shocking. So he talks about young men. Here, look at this verse here. In 1 John 2 and verse 14, he says, I have written to you fathers, so there he's talking about spiritual fathers because you've known him who's from the beginning. I've written to you young men. Now look at this, young men. This is how you can tell a young man. Young man spiritually or young woman spiritually. Young man. There it is. And it says, you are strong. I say, can tell. They're not falling over all the time. They're not weak all the time. They've got strength they have developed inside them. You can rely on them. You can depend on them. They give their word, they turn up. There's something about them that is strong and reliable and they don't fold when there's something else coming on. He says, you're strong and then it gives keys to it. The word of God abides in you and you've overcome the wicked one. The word abides in you. You notice how the person's developed strength by exercise. The Word of God is in their heart. They've been learning Scripture, reading Scripture, applying it to their heart, building it in prayer. They've developed a life strong with God, and it says you've overcome the devil. I have people constantly writing to me, oh, the devil's oppressing me, and I'm thinking, see, after all this time, you haven't learned that Jesus gave you authority. Stand up and exercise it. People act like a victim of life because they're not strong in faith and strong in the spirit. We need to make a shift. So let me just finish with this last things out of Ephesians that Paul said would happen as a consequence of a strong spirit. Ephesians 3.16, I pray that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might in the inner man. And look at this, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith an increase in the tangible presence of God in your life because you develop your strength, your spirit. That you may be able to comprehend with all saints the width and breadth, uh, width and length and depth and height and know the love of God. Increasing revelation of the Father's love is an outcome of developing your spirit man. Notice there that Christ may, uh, and it goes on to, you know, the love of Christ, which passes knowledge and be filled with the fullness of God. So strengthening your spirit and 
One consequence is you start to become filled with the Holy Spirit and your life begins to manifest peace and joy. What else? He says, now to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly all above we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church. Empowerment to discover and fulfill your assignment. Empowerment to release the presence of God to others. See, these This is the value of developing your spirit man. Strength and resilience in the face of difficulties, increasing revelation of God, increased presence tangibly of God in your life, sensitivity to things of the spirit, ability to release the power of God and minister to others. This is the value of it. How can you complete your assignment and fulfill your course if you don't develop a strong spirit. Now, we also need to learn about the heart and the development of the heart because if our heart is broken and damaged, then it hinders the flow of life from our spirit through us into the world. So dealing with the heart and developing the heart, the core of your identity, and those that, that where your desires are, all of that is what will release what you've built in your spirit. So... We need each one of us make decisions. This year, one thing I want to do is develop a strong spirit. That when I pray, there's an energy and a life and authority in my voice. That when I pray, I engage the presence of God. That wherever I go, I carry the presence of God. That wherever I am, I can stand up and not be intimidated because God is inside me. We need to do that. I'm going to share with you in the next message on some of the foundational keys how to build your spirit man. What you do on a regular basis that over a period of time, your spirit will start to strengthen. Your awareness of God will increase. You'll enjoy His presence. He wants that for you. You're designed for that. God doesn't get glorified when people maintain a weak spirit and don't develop it. You you restrict and limit what he can do in your life. When we pray and we praise the Lord, when people have got a strong spirit, they also have a voice that comes from deep within. Some people, you lost your voice a long time ago because someone did something and shut you down and wounded you very deeply. And so you lost that ability to stand up because of a deep wound. All of those things we need to be willing to address. But I want to encourage you today that this year you will develop a strong spirit, an ability to bounce back, ability to stand up, ability to be aware of the presence of God and carry the presence of God. Why don't we close our eyes right now? Maybe there's someone here and you you haven't given your life to Christ, so you're living without the Spirit of God. You're living like a spiritual orphan, cut off from the source of life, of wisdom, of revelation, of understanding, of of many, many things. You could make that all change in one minute by just turning to Christ and acknowledging your condition and believing that when he died on the cross, he paid the price for sin and broke the power of sin and everything that could afflict you and made it possible for you to enter into a new covenant where God says, I will take the stony heart out of you. I'll put in you a heart of flesh, something that feels. And I will put my spirit in you and cause you to walk in my statutes and laws. God will empower you to do the things that please Him. It just takes one decision, a decision to acknowledge your condition and to believe Jesus Christ will respond to your cry and change that condition. He will come into your life and save you. He will become joined to you because he that's joined to the Lord is one spirit. He will join his life to your life and you will now have access to the all-powerful, almighty God. Is there anyone here today, right at that point, to make that decision to receive Jesus Christ? Would you quickly raise your hand? Just put your hand up so I can see you. Any person wanting to receive Christ, God bless. Anyone else here today, you want to receive the Lord? 
to make a decision today to receive Jesus, commit your life to Him. Is there anyone here right now? Just we've got one minute to finish this. Anyone just at that point to make that decision? Just put your hand up and say, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. Perhaps over the last season, some of you have fallen back. You've lost your prayer life, lost your walk with God. And you say, Lord, I want to return to you and begin this year different. I want to start building my life with you and become strong in you. If that's you, would you raise your hand? If you're watching online, God bless us. See your hand there, hand over here and hand here. And maybe some online just watching. God wants to touch you right where you are. Why don't we all stand together right now and each of the people that put your hand up, why don't you make your way to the front? I want to lead you in a prayer and I want to pray for you for the Spirit of God to touch you and revive you. Come on, let's just stand and let's go back into that song we were singing before. It was actually quite powerful. Okay. Come on then, church. Let's just sing as we just lift our hands to the Lord right now. Those who put your hands up, when you make your way to the front, just come. Ones come. Those others that put their hands up, just come up right now. We're going to lay hands on you and pray for you. Come quickly. Come quickly. If that's you, just make your way to the front right now. God bless you, sir. God, come on, let's give them a clap as people come. Come on, let's give them a clap. God bless. God bless. God bless. Anyone else? Anyone else? wish to make your way. Maybe if someone come with you, they'll come up with you. Hey, God bless. Is there anyone else? Let's all just follow in a simple prayer. It's not just saying words. That's just doing stuff. This is about believing that I can connect again with God, but I speak words. I use the words to bring about that connection because I believe He will respond. I don't even have to say it all right or get it all right. I just believe God loves me and wants to help me. And if I just reach out, He will. Then just, just follow me in a prayer. Jesus, I open my heart to you. Come on, let's everyone pray. Let's pray with strength. Let's have voice be heard. Jesus, I open my heart to you. I believe you died on the cross and rose again. I turn to you today and ask you forgive me for every hindrance, every sin, every failure that I have committed against you. Lord, I receive your forgiveness today. I receive your spirit into my life. And I give you my life afresh. Lord, come upon me and empower me mightily. In Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, come and touch us.